you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. The book of 1 John chapter 2. We continue the series, The Test. The Test. The Bible tells us to test ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith. It says, or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? Many people, they say they are in the faith. They say they know the Lord. They say that they are a disciple of Jesus. When in fact the word of God comes along and says if you are in the faith, then there are tests that can give evidence to the fact that you have truly believed and been transformed, been made a new creation in Christ Jesus. That you can look at the word of God and measure your life against it. And you can see whether or not your life bears forth the fruit that in fact would be true of a real believer or if we are just of many of those that say, I know the Lord, but do nothing in our life to serve him, to give evidence to that we have been transformed. The Bible, we come to another test in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. That's one way to know. It doesn't say hope. It doesn't say think. It doesn't say by this we assume or this we can be pretty sure. It says by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. It does not say that if you keep his commandments that he will pay you with eternal life. It does not say that this earns you relationship with him. Of course, we know the word of God shows us that Jesus paid the price for our salvation. He did the work necessary for our redemption in full at the cross forever. We don't have to add to that. Our obedience to him does not add to that work. Rather, it is saying if that is true and you have believed that by faith and the spirit of God indwells your life, then it will show that it is real as we keep his commandments. By this we know, so we can look at our lives and say, well, am I keeping his commandments? Because that's how I know if I'm real or if I am a fraud. The one who says, verse 4, I have come to know him. Many people say that. Now, I know the Lord, they say. I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him or her. But whoever keeps his word, is to say obey his word, lives according to his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know, there it is again that phrase, that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he Jesus walked. That is because the word of God says that we are his ambassadors as Christians. We are his representatives. We are his messengers. We carry his image into the world. The Bible says, as though God, through us, were making an appeal to the world that all men everywhere should be saved. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. They are first and foremost a liar to themselves. Many people are lying to themselves that they are in the faith, that they truly know the Lord, that they have encountered Jesus, that they have truly repented of sin and been saved. The first person that we lie to is ourselves. Say, well, I'm a Christian. The Bible says in Titus chapter 1, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him being detestable and disobedient. They profess to know God. Many people profess to know God, but when you look at the fruit of their life by their deeds, they deny him. They say, I know him. Now watch me go deny him six plus days a week. But yet they say, I have come to know him. And they tell that story to their own heart, and the word of God says they are a liar. They are a liar. Jesus would say in Luke's gospel, he would ask the question so relevant today. He, what does he say? Why? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What a good question from the Lord. So why, why do you call me Lord? 
Are you a Christian? Oh, yes, I believe in the Lord. I have come to know him. Jesus comes. He said, why do you say that? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do anything I say? You don't keep my word. You don't obey the commandments. You don't honor me with your life. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That could be said of many people that populate many churches today. Why do we call him Lord, Lord, and do not do what he says? I am. Um, I have a guy, I, I, I love him greatly. Years ago, we served together in different capacities in the ministry. And we used to have honest conversation with each other. I think we still would. And um, we were talking one time, and I said to him, I said, you know, you're, you're one of the most gifted people I have ever served with in the ministry. You, you can do so many things, and you have so many gifts and talents to be given to the Lord. You ever run into those people? <laughs> Like, I have one. Like, I reach in the basket of gifts the Lord gave me, and like, I show up to preach. Okay, I got one. But, but you know, so, some people have, like, 18 things they can do. Oh, you need help with that? I, I mean, I can play a violin. I can sing. I can preach and teach and sing and dance. You know, I can't even clap. I'm, Lindsay would be like, All right, put your hands together. I'm like, I hope no one's looking. So I'm, I'm like, you know, and I'm watching her. I'm like, right then. It's like, I, I can't. Come on. No talent. I said, you know, you're one of the most gifted people I've ever served with. And he, knowing me well, I said, but, knowing I had something else to say, I said it nice. I said, but I don't believe you. And I didn't. I'm not judging anybody's soul. I'm not here to tell you who's saved or not. That's not my spot. That's not your spot. And I wasn't saying that about him. I just said, I don't believe you. And he said, what do you mean you don't believe me? I said, I don't believe that you believe what you're out there proclaiming. I, I, I don't believe it. it. It looks good. It sounds good. I mean, it's, it's almost like it's a performance to you, though. I said, I don't believe. I don't feel it deep from your heart. He said, okay, okay. I appreciate you saying that. And years later, it would be shown that he would leave the ministry and the faith for all practical purposes for a life of sin and darkness. Many people, they say they have come to know him. There's something not believable. There is something unconvincing. And maybe the Bible comes along and says, oh, that's the part where they don't keep the commandments at all. So you ask the natural question, which ones? That's what we need to know, right? Matthew chapter 22. Let's look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. The word of God says, by this you know, you, about yourself, you know that you have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says that and doesn't do that is a liar. So you, well, which commandments? Like, so someone's nervous right now. Someone's nervous. They're like, well, I couldn't even name the 10. And I know there are more and there are others. And there are these peripheral commandments. And then it gets to like 600 and something and all that. You're like, I, I couldn't name you 10. And so someone's freaking out going, do I, is it the 10 commandments? Do I have, what's the list? And so if I'm not doing that, am I not a Christian? Like which ones? This has been asked before. Guy came to Jesus and he asked that question, and Jesus gave him his answer. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Ready? It says, and he, Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Like if you want to know, like, well, if I'm gonna get one right, like what's the best one? Jesus literally gives us the one. He's like, listen, if you can only remember one, love God with everything you got. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then look what he says, verse 40. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. You hear what Jesus just said? Just do this. Love me with everything you've got. And love your neighbor as yourself. You get that right. And on these two depend or is built, hangs, 
the entire law and the prophets. You'll get it all right. Look at so what let's talk about the 10 commandments for me. Let's just use that. Are there more? Yeah. Let's use the 10 commandments, right? What does it say? Uh, <clears throat> you shall have uh, well see, it's tough. Uh, <clears throat> I am the Lord, you shall have no other gods before me, right? You shall not make any graven images. You shall make no idols and worship and serve them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Right? Keep the Sabbath holy, these kind of things. So honor and worship the Lord. And give time to, to serve him and worship and proclaim him. So, so all of these things are like, well, do I remember that? Well, look, if you love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, what are you not going to do? Well, you're not going to serve any other gods. You're not going to make idols. You're not going to take his name in vain, and you're not going to fail to worship him. You see, it, it hangs on those two commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Ten commandments. What's it say? Uh, do not lie against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's stuff. Do not steal from your neighbor. Do not murder your neighbor. Like, don't murder anybody. And so, so it's like, he said, if you love your neighbor as yourself, what are you not going to do? Well, you're not going to lie about them to ruin their reputation. You're not going to lie and bear false witness against them. You're not going to covet their stuff because you're happy for them because you love them as yourself. You're like, I'm not jealous. I'm not covetous. I love that you have that. I love for the blessings materially and otherwise in your life. I'm grateful for that. I'm not going to covet what you have. I'm not going to covet your spouse. I'm not going to take your spouse and commit adultery. I'm not going to steal from you, and I'm not going to murder you. See, how, how do you, how, like, you might not know the list, but if you know the one, you get it all right. And he says, if you can do these things. So then the first John comes along and it says, well, look, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Which ones? Look, at all you really have to do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second one's going to happen anyway. Because if you have the heart of God, let's look. Let's talk about our heart, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Oh, what did Jesus say to the religious elite of his day? Man, is, are these words alive and well today. He said to the religious, he said, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah, and he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that's the commandment. Love him with all of our heart. He said, he said, you honor me. Religious people, they honor the Lord with their lips. We've done it this morning. I can't judge your heart. I don't know you or everything about you. And let the Lord judge the heart. We honor the Lord with our lips. We honor with our lips in worship. We, we sing the songs. We pray the prayers. We read the Bible. We greet each other. We praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord, we say. Maybe it's real. Maybe it's not. But this people, he said, rightly did Isaiah prophesy there would be the religious that honor the Lord with their lips, but their heart is far from the Lord. Many people, they say, I've come to know him. They say, praise the Lord. They say, oh, thank God. And, you know, and I'm just so grateful to God. And it's a blessing from the Lord. And I exalt thee. But our heart is far from him. And so we, we, you wonder, like, well, I wonder where my heart is. You know, is my heart far from him? Do I just honor him with my lips? Well, there's a test for that, too. There's a bunch of stuff about it. We don't even have time to talk about everything. That, yeah. Just take one. Jesus said, you want to know if your heart's with the Lord? He said, well, it's easy. Where your treasure is, there's your heart. Throw in smoke, that Lord Jesus. <laughs> wow. Like he's like, oh, you want to know if you, your heart's with me? Well, where's your stuff? What, what you love, what you're about, what you serve, what you buy, what you have, and how you feel about it and what you do with it, that's where your heart is. You want to know if your heart's with the Lord and you're following that commandment? Where's your stuff? I think about our stuff. He's, he doesn't say don't have stuff. That was the problem with the rich young ruler. Was he willing to give up all that he had and come follow Jesus? And the answer was no, because that's where his heart was. That was his God. And he said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what if you sold everything and came to follow me? He's like, oh, I'm not doing that. And he went away sad because he had many possessions. Jesus, basically, the point of that is like, he, he can say it with his lips. He can come and fake follow me. But if he's not going to 
If I, if I don't have his heart, I don't have him. You can have things, but do those things have you? If they do, then God doesn't. You understand? Like one guy, he can have a house and a lawn and a car and a boat and nice stuff. No, no, no judgment. But the next guy can have the exact same stuff, and those are his gods. Those are his idols. That's what he, that's what she serves. Serve that lawn. Serve that house. Serve that furniture. Love that car. Love that kitchen. Worship those clothes and just bow, bow, worship, give. Give resources. Give time. Give attention. Give worry. Give concern. Give effort, blood, sweat, tears. That is your God. And you can honor him today with your lips, but that is where your heart is. And Jesus said, I'll tell you where you are. It's where your heart is. If it's with your stuff, that's where you are. I think about other things that might be, he said, where your treasure is, there's your heart. Uh, what, what do we treasure in this life? One of the most valuable things the Lord has given every one of us is, is time and the breath of life. The Bible says he uh, Adam, he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. What's the Bible say? Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Everything you've got, everything you desire, everything you think of that occupies your mind, that occupies your passion. Right? So we, he breathed into us the breath of life, and the Bible says he has appointed, he has ordained the days for us when we were in our mother's womb before there was yet one of them. The Bible in the New Testament says, redeem the time. Like, like, get it and offer it to the Lord. Redeem the time. And, and what do we do? What do we do with our time? Like, with, with every beat of your heart here this morning, you got closer to the grave. How happy is that? <laughs> right? I, I, mean, I mean, you're more dead now than when you walked in the door today. <laughs> like, I'm closer, if I outlive you, to doing your funeral than I was when we shook hands. Craig, when I said hi to you, you're more dead now, brother. It's, it's okay, man. We'll preach Jesus. It'll be good. Maybe I'll go first. Who knows? But, but like that, that's like we have that time. It's like boom, boom, boom. And, and what do we do with it? So there's some treasure, right? What do we do? If, if, if he said, where your treasure is, there your heart is. Where's our heart with our time? Well, uh, most people that honor the Lord with their lips, uh, they give more time to their television they give more time to their phone and clicking through senseless nonsense. Is that saying, is the word of God saying you, you can't watch TV, you can't have a phone, you can't have social media? That, that's not what it's saying. It's, it's not legalism here. It talks about things in moderation. Is, where, is that what you love? Is that what you devote all your time to? Is that what excites you? Is that what your passion is? Is that your drug? Is that what that is? And, and we give more time to TV. We give more time to phones and iPads and wasteful time than we ever would to the word of God that shows us who God is and what he wants yeah, what are we going to do? We're going to sing I exalt thee on Sunday, and then we're going to get on our phones and waste time and rant about politics or something silly, something earthly, something material later. That's where your heart is. That's what you love. Got our money. So where your treasure is, there your heart is. So, so, so we, we have our money, we have our financial resources and things like that. More people, that, many people that honor the Lord with their lips and say, I have come to know him, give more to a cable bill, give more to a Netflix subscription or Amazon Prime than they do the work for the kingdom of heaven, than they ever would even consider for an African missionary living in poverty in Sudan. They don't even know that person's name, but boy, they know the new release movies coming out that they pay for every month. No, but again, nobody's saying you can't have it, but many times those things outrank, and when you time you get to the bottom, maybe if they got 10 bucks in their pocket, it goes to the work of the Lord. Not a pastor guilting for money, quite the opposite. And in fact, uh, the, the Bible says that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and you should never give under compulsion or begrudgingly. So if you just felt guilty, like, oh, I see what he's doing, he needs some money. Don't! It's not my money, and I don't need it. If it's not for the Lord, it's not of a joyous heart, then it's no good anyway. And besides, if he wants to come get your money, he'll just come get it anyway. It's all his. He'll just come get it. He'll come get your money. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If you think that you're keeping something from God, like, get real. Like, he'll just come get it. I don't need to guilt anybody. But if there is a conviction about what you really love, what are you going to do about that? Like, there's kingdom work to be done. 
There's gospel work to be done in the world. Finances are a part of that. Sacrifice is a part of that. Generosity is a part of that. People are more generous to a, a pagan company in the world, a pagan giant of entertainment, than they are to people sitting down with people in an African village or some ministry in America somewhere discipling people in the word of God. Why? Because that's where their heart is. That's, that's, that's what their God really is. When in fact it should be flipped. It, w- when the Lord blesses us in that way, everything of the Lord, if he has your heart, then that comes first. Then that's up here. That you're like, man, where do I give this first to the Lord? And then we'll see what's left for the things of the world. But where do I give it? But people, they have it all reversed. And, but yet, you know, we honor the Lord with our lips. Then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So same question. Well, a guy asked it in, in Luke's gospel, well, who's my neighbor? So like, well, keep the commandment. Well, which ones? Well, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's my neighbor? And a guy came to Jesus one time, and Jesus was talking about the same thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy came, and he said, well, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus answers by way of parable. And he says, he gives him the answer. He's like, well, uh, there was a guy, and he was going down from a city, and he was on a desolate road, and there were these robbers there waiting for him. And he fell among robbers, Jesus said, and they stripped him, they beat him, and they robbed him, and then they left him there to die. Okay, it's a compelling story already. So he's got the crowd asking the question going, and what happened? He says, well, now what's he answering? Who's my neighbor? So there's this guy, he's pummeled and robbed and stripped and dying on the side of the road. And then he says, then a priest came by. A religious leader, he knows the things of God, he honors the Lord with his lips. So I imagine the crowd at that point, a priest, he'll show us what to do. He'll show us who our neighbor is because he knows and practices the things of the Lord, right? He is the religious example for us. Jesus said, a priest came by, and they're like, oh, and he passed by on the side of the road, did nothing. Isn't that what religion does? The very people Jesus has called us to, we pass by on the side of the road and we walk in our self-righteousness and our religious practice. We don't even see the people Jesus is waiting for. The priest passed by. Then he says, then a Levite came. A Levite is of the priestly line. He's of the, of the priestly descent. And they're like, a Levite, a Levite, the genetic descent from the priesthood. Surely a Levite will do the right thing. He said, the Levite came by and he passed by on the other side of the road and he did nothing. That's, that's what man's religion does. That's why Jesus said, what's he say? Lift up your eyes. What's he say? Wake up! Those that say they've come to know the Lord, wake up, lift up your eyes. He said, lift up your eyes. The fields are white unto harvest. These people, this beat up guy by the side of the road, beat up by life, beat up by sin, beat up by oppression of the things and the darkness in this world, pummeled into an oblivion, needing redemption for his soul. Jesus says, this isn't a happenstance circumstance. These guys are everywhere. These people, the fields are white unto harvest. What's he say? But the workers are few. Very few people see it. Most people are religious. They honor the Lord with their lips. But those people there that need the gospel, that need compassion, that need the Lord, that need the example of Jesus shown to them, those people are by the side of the road, and here's religion. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Far above all gods. You sure? And then he says, then there was a Samaritan. And as we know from the word of God, uh, he's telling this story to a Jewish crowd. The Bible says the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. There was all these racial problems and all this hate and animosity between them. So Jesus tells that on purpose because he's awesome. He's like, then a Samaritan came. And so so the, the Jews are probably like, what'd he do? Stomp him to death? What's the, so if the priest didn't do it and the Levite didn't do it, surely that Samaritan didn't do it. You know who the Samaritan is in my mind? He's the guy that comes into church. He's the lady that comes in to worship the Lord today. And somebody that's been religious for a long time is like, what are they doing here? Are they a Christian? Because they just can't believe that someone like that would come near where they are. And so, so the Samaritan comes in the crowd, the religious crowd, like, ah. He goes, and he saw him. He saw that guy by the side of the road. He says he saw him. What an example. Man, Jesus, just a razor's edge. He saw him. It starts with seeing your neighbor. Seeing him. He sees his plight. 
He felt compassion for him. Like if we love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind, then we have the heart of God working within us, and we feel what he feels for who he feels it. Right? So he, he feels compassion. It says he came to him. He, he comes to him. He doesn't wait for him to show up in church on Sunday. Like, like listen, the person that was drunk committing adultery you know, dr- driving home barely alive last night, didn't wake up this morning and go, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to head over to the rock and sing I exalt thee. Like, they didn't do, we're not, we, we don't need to be waiting for the pagan to come in. He has called us to go out to those who are lost. He came, what's he say? I came to seek and to save the lost. So if we are to follow his example, we are to go to where they are. Those, the wretched sinner isn't busting down the door on Sunday morning. We are called to go to them. So he sees him broken in his plight, and he, co- he feels compassion. He comes to him. He bandages up his wounds. He puts him on his own animal. He takes him to the inn. He pays for him to stay, and he says, no matter how long it takes, you send me the bill. I'll pay it when I come back through town. And then he asks the question, which one in the story do you think was a neighbor to the man. Like, it's so simple, it's almost insulting. Like, who do you think did it right? And the guy that asked him the question is like, the one who showed mercy, the one who showed compassion. And Jesus says it. You go and do the same. And who is our neighbor? Well, if we love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind... The spirit of the living God within us leads us to our neighbor. It could be different every day. It could literally be the neighbor. It could be the guy next door, the lady next door. It could be the family member. It could be the ex you can't stand. It could be the person at your job. It could be the person at your school. It could be the client at your place of business. It could be the stranger on the street. When we are walking closer to the Lord, all of a sudden it's like, where did I get all these neighbors? The closer we get to God, the more neighbors we seem to have. Because we, we, we start to have that heart of Jesus and we start to see the way Jesus sees. We start to feel the way Jesus feels. And all of a sudden you start noticing people you didn't notice before. When you're religious, you don't notice any of them. When, when you come to know the Lord, you start to notice as you grow in the Lord and his word and start to give more space of your heart, more space of your soul, more of your mind to him. He directs your heart. He directs your soul. He directs your mind. The Bible says he directs our path. He guides our steps. And all of a sudden you're looking, you're like, man, where, where did I get all these neighbors? I, I, I should pray for this person. I should ask this person how they're doing. I should care. I should give. I should share the gospel. And all of a sudden, you got more than you know what to do with. I don't get it all right. I'm going to tell you that. Man, you, you, ever, uh, you ever get prompted of the Holy Spirit, and then you harden your heart against the Holy Spirit, and then you're convicted of the Holy Spirit later? That's no fun. Right? You pass somebody by, maybe. I don't know. Somebody crying in the grocery store. Somebody looks, uh, looks stressed out or discouraged or sad at your job or maybe you know them, maybe you don't. And something, not every time, don't be crazy, but like when the Lord, right? There's a difference in being led of the Lord and led by crazy. It, but when the Lord, you know, some people, all right. But, but sometimes God does lead you to do Things you would never do on your own, and you feel like you walk by someone and you're just like, it might be out of character, maybe you've never done it before, but you, I've had that happen before where I feel like God has asked me, go ask that person if they're okay. Like, I don't even know this person. Like, I'm sorry, is everything okay? You look like you're crying. And, and sometimes people break down right in front of you. Sometimes God will lead you to go, listen, uh, I, I don't know what you believe. If you're not comfortable with it, that's okay. I just, I saw you, and I just felt like I should come over and ask you, if I could, could I pray for you? Could, I, could you tell me your first name? Could I pray for you if there's anything specific? Man, what God can do in those moments sometimes. And I've had those moments that the Lord is, you feel God pull over here. It's over here. Your neighbor's over here. And all of a sudden, you're the Levite and you're the priest. You're like, I'm busy, though. I got somewhere to go. I'm, I'm listening to Christian music going somewhere fast. Like, okay, they're right, the neighbor's right here, dude. And, and so you're like, ah, oh. and, and so you don't do it, and then you pass by, and later it, you're just convicted. You're like, I think that was a moment that the Lord was going to use me, and I blew it off. And so the next time you hope, man, you'll just listen to that voice. Last summer, Aaron and I were driving, I think it was last summer, it was a summer recently. 
It wasn't this summer, I know that. We were, we were driving uh, up in northern Michigan on the highway, and uh, we, we passed this car that there were some elderly people outside. It was a real hot day, and it had a flat tire, and it was just broken down on the side of the road, and they were all, like, standing out. There were, I don't know, maybe four of them or something, standing out, looking, staring at this car, looked distraught, looked hot, looked confused, and, like, what are we going to do? I don't stop for every person on the side of the road, but sometimes God has, I felt, asked me to stop. And, you know, sometimes I do it. Sometimes I've hardened my heart and wish I'd have done it. I don't like that feeling. And, and so we, we fly by at exactly the speed limit. And uh, <laughs> I was like, I just, we were mid-conversation or something, and, and we just stopped talking, and I just, I, I just felt it. I saw him, and I felt it. The Bible says that Samaritan, he saw them and he felt compassion. And then it says he came to him. I thought, oh, got somewhere to go. I'm going up north. It's hot. Like I had a decent shirt on. I, you know. so I pulled over, hit the rumble strip, started backing down the highway. Backing down the side of the road. I get out of the car and I come over and Aaron's with me. And, this guy's like, uh, can I help you? And I'm like, ah, actually, uh, you know, I just wondered, could I help you? Uh, you know, it looked like, you guys need any help with this? You got a flat tire, I guess. And yeah, and, and we don't know, like, this is a newer car. We don't know where the spare tire is. And we don't have any tools and all this stuff. I said, well, I'm no mechanic, but if you're okay with me touching your car, I think I could, I think I could manage to find it and change this tire if you want me to. And I go, Are you serious? I'm like, I'm serious. I, okay, I said, can I just like look around your car and look in the trunk? And they're like, sure. So they pop the trunk, and you know, I find it, and I find the little Toys R Us jack that they put with the eagles, and <laughs> get the little, you know, tire iron. And I, you know, I'm just gonna jack this car up. And there was a there was an older older lady in the back seat they kept inside, and, and she's gonna stay inside. Is it okay if she's in there? We got the air conditioning on for her. She had a little hat on, a little old lady hat. No disrespect, it was nice, you know, a little <laughs> little old lady. And I'm like, wow, what a nice lady. And so I, I'm cranking this tire up, and uh, this lady rolls down her window, and she says to Aaron and I, she's like, you two must be angels of the Lord. <laughs> I said, man, we're no angels of the Lord, but we're Christians, and we felt like we were supposed to stop. And, and uh, well, we sure appreciate it and all this stuff, and, and I'm pouring sweat. So she's trying to talk. And so Aaron, gets, Aaron takes over and gets talking while I'm working on this tire, just pouring sweat in my nice shirt. And I'm just you know, all greasy and stuff. And, and uh, it comes out that I'm a pastor. And so she says, are you a pastor? And I'm like, yes, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and she's like, she's like uh, uh, she, so I look up, and she's got a $20 bill hanging out in the window. Like she reaches in her purse, she puts a $20 bill out the window. And I'm like, Ma'am, I don't need twenty dollars. I did this one for Jesus. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't want your money. I don't. And she's like, "Well, are you a pastor of a church then?" And I said, "Yes, I'm a pastor of a church." And she said, "Well, I've never seen a church in my life that didn't need money." I said, I, she said, "Son, you take this twenty dollars and put it somewhere." So I, I, Ma'am, I'll take the twenty dollars. So I okay, took twenty dollars, put it in the box. Like, it's just. It felt like we we just came away grateful, you know. So, God knows what he's doing. You don't know what you're doing. Come on. Not, I'm not trying to be mean. You don't know what you're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. The Lord knows what he's doing. He knows why he saved me. He knows what he saved me for. He knows what he saved you for. He knows why he put those gifts in you. But if he doesn't have our heart, then our heart isn't directed by him. When he has our heart, when you get the first one, you're going to get the second one. He's going to take your heart. He's going to guide you. He's going to show you who your neighbor is. Sometimes it's that person. Sometimes it's somebody different. Sometimes it's a moment. Sometimes it's for weeks. What's the point? By this we've come to know him. If we keep his commandments, which ones? Love God. You'll get the rest of it. Love God with everything you got. Sometimes the world has everything we've got, but we honor him with our lips. And when we love God, he'll show us who he loves, and he'll show us how we should love them too. 1 John chapter 5. Are you a Christian? Where? Where? With our heart, soul, our mind. What do you put in your mind? What kind of movies you watch? What kind of music you listen to? What kind of words come out of your mouth? 
The Bible says, present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our uh, reasonable act of service. That's how we serve the Lord. That's how, this is our service of worship, it says in Romans 12. If he has our soul, if he has our heart, and what our soul desires and who we are at the core of our being, our body will follow. Our mind will follow. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God. Look it. That we keep his commandments. I love this part. And, and, his commandments are not burdensome. You don't hate doing it. If you really love God, it's not just about obeying by force. If he has your heart, then you're glad to do it. It's not to say there isn't trial. It's not to say that it isn't work sometimes. It's not to say there isn't struggle. But struggle is different than burden on our soul. Struggle is different than begrudging. Right, than having a grudge against it. Like, I guess this is what God wants or I'm not a Christian. Then he probably doesn't have your heart anyway if that's how you feel about honoring his word. Jesus said, if you love me, John 14, if you love me, then you will keep my word. And you're glad to do it. It's, it's obedience and glad to obey. When, when, when the more of our heart, the more of our soul, the more of our mind we give to the Lord, the more we want to give to his word and the more glad we are to do it. I'm happy to obey the Lord. And, and, and as I grow in the Lord, I'm happier now than I used to be. Because he takes more ownership over our soul and we, we crucify the flesh. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Like if you hear all this stuff and you're like, man, I don't want to do any of this. I don't know if he has your heart anyway. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. By this, all, all, everything, everything we're talking about. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother. Whew. That's a bomb right there is what that is. There it is right there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, your neighbor as yourself. Keep his commandments. Like what? So if you don't practice righteousness, you're not of God because you don't love God, nor the one who does not love his brother. The Bible says in 1 John 4, anyone who says, I love God and hates his brother is a liar. It's not talking about your genetic brother. It's talking about your brother, your sister. If you, you know, if you say, I love God, but you hate everybody, you're annoyed by everybody, you're judgmental of everybody, the Bible says you're a liar. He said, by this, these things, this is the measure by which the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. The people that really are born again and belong to the Lord and the people that are still, maybe they honor the Lord with their lips, but they are doing the works of the devil. He said, it's so obvious. If you don't practice righteousness, you're not of God. I'm not saying that to be mean or stomp anybody to death in here. I'm asking you, are you a Christian? This is a test from the scripture. By this we know we've come to know him if we honor and keep his word. Would you bow for prayer this morning? What do you think you are? Are you a child of God? You're still a child of the devil. Jesus said of a religious crew one time in John chapter 8, he said, you're still of your father the devil. You got a bunch of religious stuff down. But you're of your father the devil. There might be somebody here this morning, God's convicting your heart. I hope so. I hope you're here. I'm glad you're here. You say, man, I, I, I'm being honest. I don't see where I'm actually a Christian in my life. I don't see where God has my heart. I don't see where I love my neighbor the way the Lord called me to or even see who that is day to day. My body is not a holy vessel unto the Lord. I don't know for sure. Maybe you need to settle it with Jesus right now. Maybe that's what the scripture has revealed to you, that you still have yet to be born again in Jesus. To call out to God for salvation and truly be changed. Again, Romans 12 says, by the transforming 
of our mind, the renewing of our mind, the redeeming of our soul. Ezekiel said, I, I, God said, I'll, I'll take that heart of stone out and give you a new heart. Maybe you don't have any of that. You say, I'm hearing this this morning and I'm failing this test. If you're not sure if you know the Lord, maybe you need to call out to God for real salvation right now. You've had religion. You've honored him with your lips maybe for too long. You say, I want him to have my heart. That's why the Bible says you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So the Bible says in Romans 10.10, for with the heart we believe resulting in righteousness. Say, what do I need to do? Call unto Jesus for salvation. Say, Lord, I, I... I hear the voice of your Holy Spirit. I know I'm a sinner. I, I'm asking you for redemption. I'm asking you for salvation. To raise me from the dead works of sin. Help me follow you. Whatever those words are, call out to God right now. Settle it with the Lord before you leave. Right now.